And hi, Ruth. <laughs> hi. So nice to be talking to you in this uh, under these circumstances, exactly. even under these circumstances. Same. Um, do you want to start, and we can each talk a bit about our work, and then continue. sure. Yeah. So we thought we would just we would each begin with just a little bit of an introduction to our subjects and um, what drew us to write these books in the first place. Imani, if I'm if I'm correct, I think Looking for the Rain is not your first book, obviously, but your first biography, as it was for me. So I think, you know, for it's it's clear from reading your book how personally identified in certain ways you feel with your subject. And certainly that's something that also drew me to Shirley Jackson. Um, we were talking a little bit before about how um, they have sort of a lot of there are a lot of correspondences and confluences between their lives, coincidentally. Um, they lived overlapping lives. They both died in 1965, although Lorraine Hansberry was much younger than Shirley Jackson when she died. Um, they were both, obviously they're both female writers who struggled with being misunderstood by critics, um, both during their lifetimes and afterwards. Um, and, you know, probably relatedly, it's interesting, I think, that they are both extremely well known for a single work of literature <laughs> that entered the American canon, you know, that became incredibly well known and popularized, you know, perhaps to the detriment of the rest of their work or, you know, in it's obviously it's an incredibly fortunate circumstance for an author to have a piece of work like that that is so defining that becomes so, so popular and, you know, so loved by so many people, but I think it also probably works against audiences developing a more complex portrait of who the writer behind that work actually is, right? They become completely identified with one work, of course, for Hansberry, A Raisin in the Sun, and for Shirley Jackson, The Lottery, um, you know, the iconic short story that she published in The New Yorker in 1948 about a barbaric ritual um, that takes place in kind of in every every type of village um, that was greeted with a lot of you know both horror and confusion and excitement when it was first published and continues to be kind of a controversial piece of writing now. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say a little bit about why I decided to write this book um, as a book critic. Um, I always felt that I was sort of um, a, a biographer in search of a subject um, in that, you know, I, I really love writing criticism and I feel fortunate to have been able to make a career out of doing it. Um, but I also have always felt a little bit frustrated with it as a practice in that, you know, it's so hard to, if there's, there's no dialogue with the author themselves. The dialogue is with the work and, you know, that's, well, that's valuable. I always felt that I wanted to know more more of the personal aspect of what went into creating these works. Uh, I've just, I've always been really interested in the creative process and more than that, just what, what makes a certain person create that specific work of art at that particular moment in history? You know, what are all the forces that go into it? The personal forces, the social forces, you know, the global forces, everything that combines to make these works possible. Um, and Shirley Jackson was a writer who always was sort of a, kind of a touchstone for me. Um, I wonder if you probably felt the same way about Hansberry. You talk about your dad introducing you to her works. Uh, and for me, it was just, um, you know, a lot of people have a memory of the first time that they read The Lottery. Um, and I actually don't, but for me, the formative book of hers was The Haunting of Hell House, which is just a beautiful ghost story. It's a ghost story about a haunted house, but it also it goes so much deeper into the questions of what people fear and why they fear it. You know, what our deepest fears say about who we are as people. And so that that book was just always one that I kind of held with me as, you know, one that I returned to over and over again. But it didn't actually occur to me that I wanted to write the biography of Jackson until I read a little bit more of her work. Um, starting around 11 years ago, when the Library of America brought out a big anthology of her work, and it included some of her um, memoristic essays about her life as a mother uh, mm -hmm. and the wife of her husband, Stanley Eicher Hyman, who was a professor at Bennington, and you know their whole their household, which was kind of a menagerie of pets and four children. 
And she has this essay called The Third Baby is the Easiest, where she describes going into the hospital to deliver her third child. And the clerk um, asks her for her profession. And she says, writer. And the clerk says, I'll just put down housewife. And when I read this story, I just felt like this, this one little anecdote encapsulated everything I wanted to know about Shirley Jackson, just mm -hmm. how she managed to create the works that she did while living sort of the life of a pseudo 1950s, 1940s, 1950s housewife, um, you know, in certain ways, you know, caving to the demands and the pressures that were placed on her by society, by her husband, you know, by herself in some ways, and also you know, the constant struggle to carve out creative space for herself and her life. And it was something that felt both, you know, a very much of her moment, you know, it, it, in a way that kind of, her, that I feel that her writing defines her moment in one way, but also extremely familiar and contemporary in certain ways. And so that's what really, that's what got me here. And I will turn it over to you now. I would love to know what exactly it was that set you on your path of writing the life of Lorraine Hansberry. Oh, well, first of all, that, I mean, it, there's, there are so many um, resonances, right? And, I, and, I, and that, that story reminds me that you just um, told reminds me of um, one of the first, you know, reviews of A Raisin in the Sun describes, you know, housewife's play is a hit. Right. Mm, and, yes, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there is, I mean, there's something I think uh, that about sort of figuring out how to tell these stories, not simply as sort of recounting these women, extraordinary women in a, a, a period of history in which they were routinely dismissed and diminished. Um, but also the intensity of both intellectual and emotional labor that was required to sort of, as you're, you know, to carve out the space. And then what, for me, the 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 intellectual work of 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 carving out the sort of the after time space, right? Um, I mean, you know, and and I I assume this is similar with with um, sort of Shirley Jackson, just in terms of my, and this comes from my own encounters with her. I mean, I do remember reading the lottery, and I read it over and over again and I used to teach it all the time when I when I taught in a law school um, that you know there was this iconic figure in Hansbury with the raisin in the sun but nobody knew anything about her right it's more of an iconic play but she was relatively unknown um, and initially you know part of what I was thinking is like I want to restore her to her rightful position right she was close to James Baldwin and Nina Simone and W.E.B. Du Bois and Langston Hughes all these people who were recognized and I wanted to sort of um, place her in that pantheon and then as I was you know in her papers and seeing her diaries and journals and the all this work that had never been published that was extraordinary, I started to think, gosh, I don't want her to be, you know, to be treated iconically. I, I think the story that's important is in um, her complexity, um, having a sense of her emotional landscape, the, the intensity of her kind of intellectual life. I mean, she was, and I, and I also, you know, knew, and this was important, um, for me in wanting to kind of pursue this work ethically and in community with other biographers. There were people who were, who were working on biographies of her and, um, and lots of them kind of extraordinary theater critics and scholars. And so I said, so what, so I asked myself, what do I have to bring to telling this story? And a lot of it was, you know, when I saw her books, right? I said, oh, we read the same books, right? I mean, I could, and, and her, intellectual life made it sway into her personal life. So there would be personal letters where she's taught, the reference points are characters from novels and, you know, Veblen and Marx and all these. And, and so I thought, oh, so this is, this is what I can, um, what I can, where I can catch a likeness of her that is coincides with, with, with my own intellectual life and work and where the most, in some ways, the deepest resonance is between, um, me and her and um 
so that, you know, so, it, so I wanted to tell a story that I thought could be immediately meaningful to people. Lorraine Hansberry was relatively unknown. She was um, not out, but lesbian identified very clearly. Um, she had this extraordinary, extraordinary literary output and had gone largely unrecognized. Um, and, um, and then I also felt as though there's something about, I, I, I took on the genre, um, I, I claimed the genre of third person memoir where I was treating the biographical work as a memoir form, like sort of highlighting certain dimensions of her, of her life and work. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, so there's part that was about identity, it was part about politics, there was a part about the creative life and, and a part about loneliness. Um, and I was kismet all over the place in the process. Um, and I sort of decided to go fully with, with that. And I walked the streets she walked, visited her homes, you know, felt, you know, that I, I spent, um, I would drive to and sort of resonated for me when you were talking about Shirley Jackson, because I would drop my kids off at school in the morning, drive to the Schomburg Library, work there until like 1.30 so that I could drive the hour and a half back home to pick, pick them up from school and that. And so I guess that's a piece of it too. And I wonder um, to what extent, you know, you experience this is that obviously we, we live in a different time, but there are some, I don't know, kind of continued um, struggles, tensions, sort of complications for um, sort of living the life of the mind and doing creative work and balancing or managing a life in this world at present. And so there was, I don't know that that became a kind of driver of sorts as I pursued this work as well. Yeah, absolutely. We live in a different time, but at the same time, it's striking how the struggles that Jackson and Lorraine Hansberry experienced are both extremely resonant, you know, in in our lives, I'm sure, and also in the world in general. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you, um, I, this is a question because it was a, that, that I confronted. I mean, I think it's, in some ways it's different because we do have access to Jackson's body of work, but you know, how for you is the process of managing that people do focus on this one story and that haven't necessarily read the body of her work, but it being so central to the story that, that you're telling about her, right? How, as it just in terms of craft, how did you navigate that? Yeah, it is a little bit tricky. Um, I think with Jackson, the real issue is that um, she tends to be pigeonholed as a horror writer or as a writer of suspense at the very least, because if people do know her work, they know that other than the lottery, they're likely to know either The Haunting of Hill House or we have always lived in the castle, which is her last novel, which isn't it's you know isn't exactly a suspense story, but it has a murder in it and stuff like that. Um, so and and indeed, um, you know, to read the stuff that was written about her during her lifetime is just you know to see her painfully misrendered. Um, you know, her New York Times obituary described her as <clears throat> author of horror classic. Um, you know, as if uh, presumably referring to the lottery, as if the lottery was in any kind of meaningful way a horror story. So I, I felt, yeah, indeed, I felt this obligation to kind of to dispel that myth and provide access to the whole spectrum of who she was as a writer. And, you know, for me, that a lot of that was about finding the balance in my book between literary criticism and biography, which is something you also do a lot of. Um, you know, I've been told that it's sort of, sometimes it's frowned upon by publishers to include too much literary criticism in the book. And I feel incredibly fortunate that my publisher, my editor, you know, had no hesitancy about that part at all. Um, but I, you know, there was, obviously I felt like there's no way to tell the story of Shirley Jackson's life separate from her work. <laughs> you know, just as I didn't want to tell, try to tell the story of her work separate from her life, they just, they felt like they were completely interdependent and intermingled mm -hmm. in every way. And so, you know, I just feel lucky that, you know, I was able to write the kind of, um, bio, you know, literary biography that also was a literary study that I had you know, had envisioned from the beginning. Yeah, what about you? How did you handle that? So 
I mean, I do think it's interesting. I don't know how much I was self-conscious about it as literary criticism, but I was, there are a couple of instances in which I said, okay, well, I have to describe work that um, readers don't have access to, but also try to sort of narrate what she was doing over the body of the work, which is, you know, which is a, which was a form of criticism and also um, engage that with her own, I think, um, kind of, I mean, it's both charming and also a brilliant process of functioning as her own critic, right? And so she was often writing essays where she was like, you know, the people, and a lot of it was, in, I mean, just such incredible misapprehension of her work over and over again, and from all these different sources, and um, many of whom, you know, some angered her, and some were hurtful, and, um, and she would essentially say, you know, this, people think this is what's wrong with my work, that's not what's wrong with it, it's actually this, right, and so, so to try to explain what she was doing in the self-criticism, and then also what she was doing out of the view of a public um, what her, you know, her priorities were. I think particularly for me with the, um, the pseudon pseudonymous writing under the, the name Emily Jones, which was basic, which was more often this sort of lesbian and queer themed writing, um, which had not only hadn't, I mean, it had been published, but people didn't, when it was published, they didn't know it was Hansberry, but also um, it hadn't been written about in relation to her. And so to try, and there's a kind of brief mention um, that Adrian Rich has of it in the 70s, and then it sort of never uh, re recountered. So I, so I tried to talk about the distinctive voice that she um, cultivated in that work, the kind of increased um, lyricism and tenderness. And um, and so, to, to, so it became, I mean, as you're saying, a kind of a way of talking about her life and what she was feeling as well as what she was producing intellectually. Um, I don't know, I think there's also um, this dimension about sort of how to be, it was an aspect of, of this is sort of how to be critical uh, in the, at the same time as that the, the larger body of the work is an argument of how extraordinary this person was and how they've been miscast, just, a kind of, you know, and I think at certain moments, um, I raised questions that I could have pursued further about, you know, question, critical questions about her life and work. But um, overall, I, it was, um, I think I tried to sort of do justice and well, I'm not objective, at least be kind of rigorous. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. That's something I actually wanted to ask you about was, you know, you clearly are writing your book from a place of love your subject uh, I don't like probably love isn't too strong a word right no, not absolutely. appreciation but you know um I, I think for so many of us biography is an act of love right it is it is a relationship yes <laughs> a committed relationship yes. <laughs> <Long -term, laughs> years of your life with this person mm -hmm. um, trying to get inside their head in whatever way you can yeah. Um, so I've been curious, you talk in the book a little bit about your process of, you know, traveling to the places where, uh, walk, you know, walking in her footsteps and you have such a moving account of visiting her grave. Um, I'm curious if there are any uh, other, um, you know, what were your techniques for trying to, you know, to, to for achieving the, the mind meld <laughs> to the extent that it's possible? You know, I think a lot of it was, I mean, you know, it, it, there's something, there's a way, and I don't, I would love to know about your experience with this. Like when I start in archives, I'm looking for something initially, and then sort of progressively, especially after you read through sets of boxes repeatedly, you start, the disposition turns towards receiving, you know, like, so that it's supposed to like, you're trying to discover things, the discoveries come about because of the repetition, right? That's what, you know, which is what it, I mean, that's sort of also what the critic does in, in general, right? When you're like sort of, when you encounter a work that you're engaging critically. And so um, I think that that was a lot of it and became much more attentive to references to her in general, like not even when I was in research, but just sort of as I was moved through life and it's, um, um, yeah, and I, 
I also rem I started to remember younger encounters with her work. You know, I think it's sort of like the the intensity of study, and it can seem sort of I don't know like esoteric um, as you <laughs> as you're in it, but it's also how you know memory functions in in ways that we don't we're not fully cognizant of, and so the you know things come back to us moments moments return right. You have these like kind of, you know, um, lightning bolt experiences. And, and I do think there's something about time that it's required that, you know, it's why time is required, right? Um, for projects. Yeah, how long did you spend working on your book? It's so hard to answer that because, I mean, I guess formally it was three years, but it was much longer. I mean, I wrote a, a, a paper that was never published that was pretty long and extensive about Hansberry 12 years ago, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I just like, I, you know, I go through my email, there's like, you know, a thousand Hansberry re related things that I said over the past 20 years. And since I have all my email messages from forever, they're there. What about you? What was that? I spent six years on it, start to finish. I mean, mm -hmm. not all of them were totally in the thick of it. I would say probably like three years of that was really, you know, single-mindedly as, as much as possible when one has children and all that is right. <laughs> lively, quote unquote, devoted to the book. Um, but yeah, I really, what you say about, about the archive and, res and repetition really resonates with me. I felt like a lot of the process was about learning how to read Shirley Jackson's archive. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure that, that, I mean, that's, it's the only archive that I have that kind of deep experience with. I'm sure that must be true in general, but, but you know, that the archive, Exactly, you're you're looking for stuff in the beginning, but you don't always know what you're looking for. You know, you think you're looking for something, and then it turns out you find all these other things that you didn't know you were looking for. Mm -hmm. um, I had an additional kind of challenge, which was that um, Jackson's archive wasn't very well organized. Um, it sounds for me like the way you describe um, Lorraine's husband. It sounds like he was a really um, meticulous guardian of her legacy and how, you know, how incredibly fortunate she was to have that. And I remember thinking about it. I also did a little bit of work in Ralph Ellison's archive, which is also in the Library of Congress with Shirley Jackson's, um, because the, they knew each other well, both of their, their, the families knew each other well and were close family friends. And I found myself feeling, literally feeling like I wanted to thank Fanny Ellison for the you know incredible labor you could see that she had done there organizing all of his papers it felt like a you know a gift to me yeah. whereas you know with Jackson unfortunately um, you know I think Stanley probably would have done that for her but he died only a few years after she did you know unexpectedly so I think you know he wasn't preparing for that in any way and her papers were kind of dumped at the Library of Congress for archivists you know to do the best with that they could and it was you know not easy she she was herself not an organized file keeper mm. so there were lots of you know it, it lent it, it lent itself to serendipitous discovery <laughs> it's like you know in the middle of a folder full of what was supposed to be drafts for one novel i'd find you know the draft of something totally unrelated um, and so there are, you know, useful juxtapositions where you can see, you can wonder, oh, might she have been working on these two things at the same time if they're, you know, filed in the same folder? Is it just an accident of history? Um, but it turned out there are a lot of folders marked um, miscellaneous. <laughs> <laughs> so did you have create your own method of, of organization? Like when you, you know what I mean? Like how did you... That part, I think that was the hardest thing about the whole process, I think, was um, organizing my research. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you found it that way as well. I was fortunate, I felt fortunate the Library of Congress allows you to make digital copies, you know, as, as you wish. So yeah. I just kept going there with my phone and my scanning app and, you know, click, 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 click. I based, you know, almost everything that I found worth it because also, you know, like you, I was writing this book when I had small children, so it felt like every visit I made to the Library of Congress was a race against the clock. You know, I could only ever get away for like two or three or four days at a time. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, plunk myself down and just try to consume as much material mm -hmm. as possible, you know, just kind of gorge on it. And then I figure out, I'd figure, okay, well, I'll just, 
I'll make sense of it all later. Right. Um, yeah. But, you know, yeah. there are there. And I noticed in your book, you mentioned there is a place where you find a word, an obscure proper name in a, a poem of hers, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. you you say, oh, I didn't know what this was. And then later you find it. Yeah. And I had that experience too, over and over again, where like I would, you know, take an image of something, you know, notes she had scrawled for something and they would be basically unintelligible to me. And then like a year later, <laughs> I would come up, I would read the thing that made it possible to understand what had been going on there. Yeah, which, which speaks to the point about how much it is a relationship, right? And um, it's funny, I also think about, you know, the, the the way on the one hand there's a kind of disadvantage especially in some of the kind of market logics of writing about it this sort of not an immediately recognizable figure right or an image not coming to mind or the like um but that a different there's a way in which right the the narrative is not preordained when it's not sort of this person who's you know has a, a an image you know and a story you know beforehand and you expect as a reader to go through it. And I guess that's to me sort of the the, the other sort of the other side of that phenomenon, right? So that you like that process of discovery is also feels, at least for me, and I wonder if it did for you, like something freer because there wasn't um, so much of a preordained story. I mean, the only thing that I felt frustrated with honestly was the repetition, and maybe this is this is, I mean, I, I could be self-critical of myself about this, but um, the narrative that, you know, she died so young, what could she have done had she not died at 34 years old? And I'm, you know, she, she just did an extraordinary amount and lived such an extraordinary life. And I think also for me being in the process of personally grieving so many people, this sort of idea of, you know, the grief is, is important, but the life is as well. Um, and so to sort of, so that was the one thing, but I felt like there's a, a wide berth to, you know, to tell who she was. Mm, yeah, for sure. Yeah, to keep the focus on what she accomplished rather than whatever mythically she might have been able to do. Um, I just want to remind people, we are going to take questions mm -hmm. in a little bit. So feel free to put questions for us in the Q&A while we're talking. Um, so did your, speaking of, you know, how this is a relationship, did you feel your relationship with her changed over the course of your working on the project or was it always pretty much what you expected it to be? It changed. Um, I, it felt, um, or I changed in witnessing her. Um, I think particularly her, um, her moments of self-doubt and self-criticism and the way that she talked, I'm scattered, I'm always thinking about too many things. And, and actually the tenderness and generosity I felt that she didn't grant herself actually had the process of making me ultimately more generous with myself and more comfortable with experimentation. So I felt like it changed me a lot as a writer as well. What about you? Was that in terms of the relationship or those yeah it's that's it's interesting to think about what you know what your your subject has to teach you as a writer mm -hmm. um a, a reason to be very careful about whom you choose right, right. <laughs> that's, that's true <laughs> because you may well pick up their habits whether you want to no. <laughs> um you know I, my perception of jackson didn't really change uh, you know, I, I, my, my kind of overall understanding of who she was as a person and what she was trying to do as a writer um, was constant from the beginning to the end. Um, I, I guess the thing I found out that surprised me the most, which, you know, the thing that kind of went against the conventional narrative of her life, such that people know it, people, um, you know, if people know about her life, what they know is that um, she was obese, she was, you know, supposedly addicted to drugs and alcohol, though I think, you know, it's standards were different back then and all that. And I, I didn't want to actually diagnose her with addictions that she hadn't been diagnosed with. Uh, but that she, you know, she was a heavy user of drugs and alcohol. Um, and that towards the end of her life, she was ag agoraphobic to the extent that she wasn't able to leave the house. Mm. And, 
what I discovered actually, you know, of course, all these things were true to a certain extent, um, but the extent to which um, some of those who wrote about her life focused on her weight was something that I found really troubling. Okay. And, you know, also heartbreaking the extent, to the extent that it was something, you know, that she struggled with so much during her life. And one thing I found in her archive were these dialogues that she used to keep, um, where she literally, when she was trying to lose weight, she would literally write down the meals that she ate with their calorie counts and she would track her weight on the same page. And then you could see sometimes in the same notebook, she'd be writing down ideas for stories. And that, that really, you know, brought to the fore for me, the, you know, it dramatized the extent to which she was wasting her creative energy on worrying about her weight. You know, if only she had been able to spend, spend that time thinking about things other than like how many calories were in her hard boiled egg breakfast. Um, but the, the narrative, I guess, that I really wanted to write against was that she was this, um, you know, kind of this, this invalid who was, you know, who deserved people's pity. When in fact, what I found is that at, towards the end of her life, she worked with a therapist, you know, she did a lot of work with a therapist to counteract her agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. and you know was in fact recovered from it and she spent the last six months of her life um doing a big um reading tour all over the east coast and in the midwest she was working on two separate new novels when she died um and so you know this arc the arc of her life tends to be seen as one that like you know ends with a creative descent and it was really kind of doubly tragic for me to see that she had a physical descent that was matched by this creative ascent at the end of her life. Mm. Wow. Should we start to, I think there is a bunch of questions. There do seem to be a bunch of questions. Um, Karen, do you want to pop back in and steer us in the right direction there? Sure. Um, okay. One question in from the chat is I'd love to hear more about the temporality of your research. How do you organize your work in a way where you can return to material and recognize its new resonances over time? And that's that's a great question for the biographer, especially dealing with so much material. So how would you how would you both answer that? I mean, for me it's it's and this is with actually with all my writing structurally, it's really iterative. So I, you know, you have the documents, right? Like those, <laughs> those scanned documents, right? That are in a big file or folder on your computer, but actually sort of structuring their relationship with each other in outlines in a variety of ways and kind of seeing what emerges with each structure. So I, I outline over and over and over again. So it's sort of like structuring pieces of information um, repeatedly until I um, feel cl so. So I guess it's the organization is 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 um, takes a long time to achieve, and I reorganize repeatedly. Yeah, I think the organization for a book like either of ours is maybe, I don't know, 80, 85% right. of, the work, yes. of the work on it. It's so important to just figuring out where things go um, is so important, right? And for me, I, well, I use the writing program Scrivener, which I'm a total evangelist for. And I just highly, highly recommend it for like book size writing projects in general, because it allows you to keep your your drafts and your research in the same file, basically, in like one giant files if it were a filing cabinet and then you can search for you know in, it, you can do word searches for whatever you're looking for but for me it was about like kind of building uh, you talk about outlining I built endless timelines you know I had one timeline of like events in Charlie's life and then a whole separate timeline for her writing uh, you know figuring out both when she drafted things uh, and as well as when they were submitted to publishers, when they when they actually were published, so that I could really you know track by the month or even you know sometimes by the day what she was doing when she was writing um, you know certain of her works. I found that really really helpful. 
There's another question about even before the organization, um, what you do in an archive. Um, so the question is, I wonder if you'd say a few words about locating or surfacing clear narratives in archives and documents, especially incomplete archival records. I think it's a, it's a related question, but has a, a different um, aspect to it. I guess, Ruth, with, with your comment about um, dealing with such a disorganized archive, this must have come up all the time. Um, yeah. To I mean, kind of doing, puzzle things. Yeah, I wasn't dealing with explicitly queer narrative. You said queer narratives, right? I wasn't dealing with that in the way that I'm Oh, no, I said clear. Oh, clear okay. narratives. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, queer narratives are also, you know, in, in, I have a whole other archival question, right? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it was really for me just a question of immersion to the extent, you know, to, to whatever extent was possible of just, um, you know, I had, to, I had to make my own narrative out of that archive. It was not presenting a narrative to me. And the way I chose to do that was by imposing the chronological structure on it. If that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm sure you have more to say about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I do think immersion, you, you read, you just keep, I mean, it's sort of this, you read and you read and you read. And, and for me, it was also going to the archives of friends in order to complete conversations. So I'd have a letter from someone and then to go to their, to, you know, to figure out, did she send it? A letter back that they read or how do you deduce if she hadn't what the substance of that was by seeing the other communications um and in some instances you know it was um sort of going to archives of organizations that she participated in, like sojourners uh, for truth and justice right there's not a lot that she wrote about it but i could find you know here's an essay and go back and see when she worked in those and even many details that i didn't um describe in the book, but that I needed to understand her development, right? And so I think that's the other piece too, um, is that you don't necessarily read for for details that you're going to recount. You read the first, I don't know, a hundred times to get a, you know, to a, catch a likeness of a person, to get a sense of their story. And then later, the question of which details are most relevant emerges. Yeah, I really like the way you put that. I mean, for me also, um, I think when, you know, in terms of writing the bi oh, uh, the biography of a woman of a woman writer, um, oh, there's a lot was not included in the archive um, just by virtue of who she was and who she corresponded with. Um, like you mentioned, looking for her, looking for your subject's letters in uh, other places. And for me, like there were times when I was able to do that, like when she corresponded with Ralph Ellison, she corresponded with Kenneth Burke and a few other writers, but she also corresponded with a lot of women. She had a lot of women friends and those papers ought to, with very few exceptions, were not preserved. And, you know, that's, I think, part of the, I had, you know, a couple of really wonderful, exciting successes where I was able to find papers, um, you know, almost by chance that had been kept by people's families. But, you know, so many other ones where the where letters get lost. Mm -hmm. Okay, I love that phrase, catch a likeness. It's such a gentle way of, of that, all that work that goes into trying to figure out um, who your subject is. Um, here's here's a both a practical and a kind of philosophical question. Uh, where do you think the bio the where do you think the biography ends and where the biographer begins? And I think this is a good question for the both of you who appear in, in your work um, at at various times, very and and in 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 very beautiful ways, and I think very helpful ways um, for the reader to to move with you through this experience of knowing your subject. So yeah, I'm curious how you would respond to this question. I, you know, I think that's such a, um, in some ways an individual question. I mean, I think, you know, to keep in mind that bi biography is craft and it's art as well, right? And so that question, um, I think in some ways depends upon the, the biographer and, and the subject, right? And that, 
the decision to include oneself or not to include oneself or how comprehensive to be or you know is it is whether you write like a, a really detailed cradle to grave story or um focus on a, a particular period of, of life i couldn't sort of generalize but i think that's an important question to ask um i mean you know i was thinking a lot about the relationships that are available with this person um, and put myself in that but uh, for me it was also the hope that readers would it would open up space for readers to think about how to put themselves in relationship with this person in a way that is immediately meaningful for the, for lots of people i mean there's a way in which you know people sort of fall in love with lorraine um in many ways that i thought i wanted to tap into but um, I wouldn't necessarily have to take that same approach um, in others with other people as subjects, you know. Yeah, I feel like it's almost it's impossible to say where the biography ends and the biographer begins, or I don't know, maybe the other way around. It seems it even if you know one writes a book that's less personal, the decisions that you personally make, your own perspective on how to tell this person's story and how you read their works. Um, it's just, it's a part of every single page. Um, this is a question addressed to both of you. How did producing biographies change your prose style? Did you find yourself taking up elements of style from your subjects? You've responded to that a little bit so far, um, but in, are there other direct examples um, of, of moments where you feel that your subject um, took over um, or were, help, were helpful in some way to, to the writing of the biography? I would say, actually, I, I feel that writing my biography made me in some ways more confident as a writer um, or helped me develop my own personal style, even as a, as a response not to let Shirley Jackson's voice dominate my biography. Um, and that was something that I kind of came out through the process. I had um, part of an earlier draft that I showed to my editor, um, kind of wanting a, um, a reality check, saying like, okay, is what I'm writing here actually a biography? <laughs> um, because, you know, I felt like I, I felt like I was kind of making it up as I went along, or, you know, certainly learning how to write a biography as I went along. Um, and my editor said basically um, that I needed to have more of myself in the book, that I needed to be able to trust my own literary voice more and not rely as heavily on quotations and other people's words. Um, and I think that's something that I have taken into my other work as a critic as well, that um, in the years since I wrote this book, my critical voice has become in some ways more personal. Mm. What about you? You know, I, I, I think it's interesting because because when I proposed um, writing this book, I did not do it in what is considered the right way. Um, you know, I sort of called up Beacon. And I was like, do you think I could do this? And they were like, okay. So they took a chance because um, I hadn't, I had written kind of, I mean, it's not conventional, but closer to conventional academic writing. Everything else I'd written thus far at that point had been from a university press. And um, and so I was very eager and I've always been kind of more frustrated, a frustrated writer um, in some ways because of wanting to write beyond those, the, the, the borders of conventional academic writing. Um, and so the process freed me both because of the press, you know, and the wonderful folks at Beacon, but also because of the subject. And it would have been, I think, a real, um, you know, limitation and loss if I did not, you know, approach a register of writing that is at once intellectual and emotionally valenced and it's historic, but also sensitive to, um, you know, the, the, the gushy insides of us that we have as human <laughs> beings. And so, um, so it, I always say that Lorraine changed my life because it was an opening. It was a, that um, is one that I had long longed for. Um, and certainly reading her experimentation with form and style over years was uh, a model for, for that as well. 
I actually have another question along those lines, if I could. I wonder, did you find it hard to move on from this book after you were finished with it? So I found it hard to move on as I was writing it, actually, <laughs> because I wanted it to be three times as long. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, I think this is why I relied so heavily on the community of people who are writing about Hansberry in various ways. And like, you know, when I would get information after the book was gone, had gone to press, like, instead of being like, oh, I can't believe I didn't have this to put, I would send it to people. Like, and sort of for me, it became, in my conception, and I think, you know, everybody has been so wonderful, I think, in this community of people writing about her, um, that we're kind of collectively earning her, her, her space in the world. And that's how it, that's how I sort of manage the, um, the difficulty with moving on, but I still wind up writing stuff down about her. I'm just not publishing it right now. How about you? Are you, do you still feel in the Jackson world? I do. I mean, yeah, in different ways, I definitely am still a part of the world. Yeah. I can't imagine ever moving on from Shirley Jackson period. Um, yeah. And I, I, in fact, just, um, last year edited for the library of America a collection of her early novels, which felt like a wonderful way to kind of be officially back in that world again for a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, moving the, I, I also didn't want my book to end. And I, in fact, I delayed writing the last chapter um, in which I dealt with Shirley's death. I delayed writing it as long as possible, basically, um, until my editor basically was saying, it's time to turn it now. <laughs> You must write it. Uh, I just, yeah, I just, I didn't, I didn't want the book to end. I, you know, I didn't want her life to end. The experience of, of working on it was at such a period of, you know, intense absorption for me and so rewarding um, creatively and critically that it was really, really hard to leave that behind. Mm. There's many questions and I know we won't get to all of them, but I'll, I'll just ask you a couple more. Um, this person asks, did you ever get mad at the people you were studying before loving them? If love is the right word. Um, had they done something you knew would not be easily explained and how did you grapple with that? I mean, I was, I was um, angry for, with Lorraine. I mean, I had, I, I had long loved her, but for not acknowledging what I thought was a very clear influence of Gwendolyn Brooks on her work. Um, and generally speaking, um, though claiming an identity as a feminist, um, focusing much, much more on men as, as uh, intellectual and political role models. I mean, I would just would say you can, you can love someone and be angry with them at the same time. There's <laughs> a, you know, there are a lot of things that Jackson did that I, you know, wouldn't personally approve of, you know, or, you know, I, I think probably many things she did that later on she would have liked to take back if possible. And then, you know, there are many anecdotes and instances of her, you know, not being very nice to people. <laughs> she, <laughs> apparently, you know, and many, she was often very, a very charming person, but also a person with a very, very sharp tongue. Um, and, you know, certainly there are a lot of, there are plenty of questionable, questionable decisions that she made in her life, but they you know, weren't enough to make me stop loving her. Okay, I think this is the last question, but um, it's, a, it's a broad one. Um, and, and you've touched on it a little bit, but the, the person here asks um, to hear more about the intermingling of life and art in your subjects and how you each inter interrogated the art in terms of the life and looked at the life in terms of the art. There are specific examples of, of moments where you needed one to read the other. Um. Hmm. Yes, one kind of, I'll just say briefly, Imani, while you think about that. Uh, one, one, one way in which this was immediately apparent to me was that um, Jackson had kind of a creative boom after she had her first child. Um, like you could literally see it in her writing. Um, and on the one hand, it was a difficult period for her. She was trying to write and also take care of a baby, um, but it was incredibly fertile. And in the in just a couple of years, it, in the years before her son, her first son was born, 
she had been struggling. Um, she was kind of struggling to figure out what kind of writer she wanted to be. She was writing a lot of humor pieces that she for the New Yorker that didn't quite land in the right place. She was trying to figure out if maybe she wanted to be a, a cartoonist. And then after he was born, something kind of opened up for her. And that's when she started, you know, she was writing dozens of short stories in every year and submitting them all over the place. Oh, I love that. I mean, I just, it's just, I guess I, um, I'd say that, you know, I, I, it was relatively easy with Hansberry in that she did a lot of sort of vignettes and sort of sketches that would, that, if you could, I could match them up with her date book and her, like what she was doing at it. You know, it just was very easy. You could see there's a, there was this constant repetition and flow between what she's reading, what she tries to work out on paper, what she encounters on the street, what she's ha what's happening in her personal life. Um, so in some sense, she left a record that made that relatively um, easy, actually. Um, I would say the thing that felt most sort of um, I don't know that where that really raised the question and raised the question for me in terms of my own writing was actually her drawing, her visual art, which she didn't do professionally, but that it, there's a lot of um, how she sees herself that was evidenced in, in the drawings and the paintings um, and the words that she uses on them. And that became for me the kind of one of the ways to access, I think for me, one of the really important ways to access what was um, her interior life, even though she had pretty extensive diaries. 